We're speaking with Tony Kettle, who is an international principal at RMJM Architects in Edinburgh, Scotland. Uh, his lecture to the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat was about the politics of high-rise, and certainly there's no more place uh, on Earth that's more political than Russia, which is where a lot of your prominent work is. And uh, you're telling us about uh, primarily two projects, the Gazprom Tower in St. Petersburg. Briefly describe that, that one of the tallest buildings in Europe when it's finished. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of the most important projects for Russia. Um, the Gazprom oil company, which really is the new um, force within Russia, the new reason why it has some strength in the world economy. Um, it, it's an HQ for them. It's a tower project. Um, it's also an investment into the city of St. Petersburg, um, several, sev several public buildings uh, as part of this whole development. And this would be the tallest building in Europe? Currently, it would be the tallest building in Europe, that's right, because of the recession, because of so many other projects have been uh, delayed or, or cancelled. Uh, but really, we didn't design it to be the tallest building in Europe. Um, we designed it to be one of the most beautiful buildings in Europe, and, and to really to suit its place. And as architects, we're all about context, all about culture, all about celebrating what's special about a place, and that's what we've tried to do with this project. We're going to talk also about the City Palace in Moscow, uh, which is another of your projects. It's a, uh, uh, well, we can talk about it just briefly here. It's kind of another twisting, turning, turning torso type building, but what's your brief description of that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting because there are so many twisting towers these days um, that they become slightly devalued. Uh, we started uh, designing this many years ago as part of a competition for the site at City Palace. Uh, and it's actually a sculpture. And it's a sculpture which celebrates weddings, a wedding palace, which is part of the brief for the, for the project. And compared to, say, a normal commercial development on that site, which would be an extrusion or some kind of tower which would try and maximize commercial space by just being big and brutal, and what we did was we subverted the commercial requirements and used it to celebrate weddings. And the whole sense of a man and woman being in an embrace as, as part of a wedding ceremony uh, is what the tower is all about. So it's, it's a sculpture which celebrates weddings. And it just so happens that you get twice as much commercial space within it as you would if we hadn't done it that way. And the inspiration for the design was Rodin's sculpture? Many, many inspirations. I mean, if you go to St. Basil's uh, on, in Red Square, you'll see the twisting domes. Uh, if, if you uh, go to one of the Russian weddings, um, you'll just see how the whole ceremony takes place and how there's a, a kind of sense of arrival and, and the, 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 com the coming together of the two people and obviously the other things that do that really well such as the, the sculpture and the sculpture is um, an artwork in itself the, 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 the picture I have in my head is not the Rodin sculpture but when it was wrapped um, by an artist and then it, it took on another level and in some ways that's what I've tried to do with the, the kind of commercial building is, is to, to wrap it and give it this other um, sense to it and when we presented it to the mayor of Moscow, you know, it wasn't the tallest building on, on the site in, 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 uh, on, on Moscow City, but what he said was it, it was, a, zoo, it was a, a woman in a sea of men. You, know, you had all of these big, brutal, commercial objects surrounding it, and here's this quite delicate object, and a delicate object which tries to symbolize something very positive about coming together, about marriage. And that's an interesting theme for a building. I don't know that I've ever heard uh, an idea from a build for a building coming from something like that, so that's very interesting. And and the the sculpture that we're referring to is the Kiss by Rodin. Um, did he get the uh, Did he get the context? Did he understand what your design was about? Or what was what was his reception? Uh, I mean, very much. I mean, we we tried to design buildings so that they have levels of understanding. So you can look at it from an urban context and see one thing, and then as you get closer, you see something else, and it builds and it builds. So we, I mean, we, we very much believe that what he saw in it was something which was a, a sculpture and, and something quite different from what was happening around. Well, and something very Russian? Yeah, you know, Russians are incredibly passionate, sometimes incredibly hard, but also incredibly passionate. So you know, you have all of these kind of male objects around it, surrounding it, that are quite hard. And then some, suddenly you've got this soft object which is, which is more feminine, perhaps. One of the things I always like to ask people about are how visions of height 
tall buildings, high rises, translate in different cultures because you see things in certain cities, uh, in Shanghai, for example, that you certainly wouldn't see here in Chicago. Um, and that's one of the things that I would like to talk to you about is how the vision of height translates uh, in the Russian culture. And I think Gazprom Tower is a very good example of that. And the thing that struck me about its design is this, is this fine filigreed, almost lace star pattern you have in there that's very Russian, I guess. Where did that come from? It, it, was, it was more a sense of place. OK. Um, the, the, the whole essence of the tower was actually trying to reinvent the idea of a tower fr from the ground up, fr from basic first principles. Uh, so we were inspired by the fortress, which was a kind of five-sided um, novel design at the time, you know, when it was designed as a fortress for defense. And we thought, can we kind of subvert that and use it rather than a negative as a positive? Can we use it to try and get daylight to come deep into the plan of the building? So we actually have five towers which extrude and twist and then come together as one object. And between each of these towers, and these, these, are, these towers are orthogonal, simple space that's very usable. But between each one of these towers is this kind of captured space, organic space. And, and so the whole, the whole building has this kind of fluidity to it. And the fluidity is a reference back to water in the city, which has been its lifeblood. And then also, um, St. Petersburg varies from minus 27 to plus 30 degrees. So you get the flowing water to, that, to the kind of crystalline water. So the crystalline water was a reference to the skin. The Art Deco Bridge, which is quite close by, was a reference to the skin. And there are some beautiful paintings by uh, Filinov, which, which are kind of anti-cubist paintings, which take a kind of similar uh, view of taking fragments of the city and putting them together within this, this kind of um, crystalline form. So we've, what we've done is we've layered, uh, on, on, uh, again, uh, on levels on top of one another to try and give a richness to the building. Uh, and hopefully that all works together. Is this necessarily, uh, by its definition, a Russian kind of geometry? Because I, I know they have an affection for just kind of tiny intricate things. Is that part of what's going on here? I think you're sensing the kind of Baroque quality of what yes. we've done. And there's, there's kind of two elements. You might say there's the kind of Baroque of the Hermitage. You know, Rastrelli was a fantastic architect. He was going around the city um, designing these fantastic Baroque buildings. And basically, they were kind of classical buildings with a, an applied decoration that give it a richness. And then t to the other side, there's the kind of national romanticism of the Church of the Spilt Blood, which has twisted domes in the same way as St. Basil's in, in, in Moscow. So you have these kind of elements of richness that the people of Russia really kind of link back to. And perhaps going back to the Moscow City project, you know, that richness that we managed to get into the project was something that they found that they needed, that, you know, that they, they welcome it, they need it. And so what we've tried to, to do is to create a building which encompasses the Baroque, it en encompasses movement and, and, a, and, a, and a romanticism within it, which has a richness and a warmth to it. And looking at, <coughs> pardon me, looking at some of the renderings, there are just some incredible, very open interior spaces where you have the light streaming in through this fine, through this fine texture. Uh, describe those spaces that you're trying to create within the building, very open and very light. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the light in St. Petersburg is, is fantastic when it, when it happens. You know, it's just fantastic. Um, you know, you, you get um, the, the, the long evenings where it's called white nights. You know, you get the long evenings where the, the sun never sets. And you get other days when the, the light's bouncing off the Neva. And, if, and, and any, any horizontal surface which um, it, it, the reflections hit are just alive. And so I was trying to capture a kind of a, a space where you could, you could get um, shadow. If you think of it rather than light, the shadow as well, you know, the beautiful patterns of shadow. And one of the main spaces is at the top of the building. It's a public viewing gallery. It's 70 meters high. And, and it's a cathedral um, for the celebration of public viewing. Amazing. Uh, have you done light studies on this to see what the light reflected from the building is going to look like? Is it going to be this kind of crystalline, shimmering entity also? Yeah, I mean, we see the thing as a living object. And, and when we rendered it originally for the competition, um, there were two very strong renders, and, and, and one was kind of, you could say, almost corporate, and the other render was, was a Baroque golden spire. And all we were doing was setting the sun. 
were just moving the sun in the sky, and it was just two two renders from from that movement. And I think you know nowadays we can get renders which are almost more real than photographs, and in real in the sense that you know where the sun is, and so we should be getting exactly the same effect with the real object. Tell me about the client. Tell me about the client Gazprom. Um, you don't think of, of a building like this necessarily as being the headquarters of an oil company. And this is something that is, they are the engine for, for Russia's economic future. Uh, tell me about them. What were their requirements and what was it that they asked of you? Yeah, I, I mean, in some ways, I think being an architect is, is reading the, the, the part that they can't tell you. Um, and I think that the love that, that the Gazprom guys, you know, the senior staff within Gazprom are from St. Petersburg. And the love they have for their city which was kind of overwhelming. Um, you know, they, they wanted to see something very special, and they wanted us to, to give it, you know, give them that in a way that they couldn't they couldn't put into words, they couldn't put into a brief. Um, so, uh, if I find it very ironic when most people might think of Russia as 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 the kind of cold side, the brutal side, and when I see the kind of passionate side, the warm side, the loving side, and that's what we try to capture for this building. And you say that you've been going to St. Petersburg for, what, the better part of 15 years? That's right. So you know the city very well. What have you learned about it in your time there? And what, what of your time there has gone into the design of this building? Um, I, I think the, 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 the cultural um, sense of, of this, um, the hardness versus the softness within their culture, of the formality versus the informality, um, you know, we, we, we were invited by UNESCO, ironically, to, to um, do a project on the, on the Hermitage Museum. And, um, you know, even uh, w within that, that palace, you know, that palace has changed and adapted to different uses through its life. You know, you saw um, different for you know, types of space, for formal spaces, informal spaces. You saw um, a, a kind of the, the life of, of the, the royals, of the czars from previous generations. Um, and the respect that the Russian people give to that as well uh, through, through generations. Uh, you know, you saw, um, you know, the, the, um, the problems with fire, with communism, with, with um, the, 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 the actual spaces within the buildings, very special spaces within the Hermitage, um, where above the throne room there was a special room that, you know, a guy sat there with a, with a um, uh, defending the, the czar below his whole life in this, this attic space that very few people would ever see in their life. You know, bizarre things, um, but also things that were kind of, of, of great richness. Tell me about the building. The height of the building is what exactly? The design height? The design height is 396 meters. Uh, and the height is a, a result of beautiful proportion. Uh, it's what we felt was the best balance between the, the client brief requirements for area and our requirements to try and get this as the most beautiful object that we could for the city. And when you look at pictures of St. Petersburg, you get the sense of that it's a very horizontal city. Um, and I'm glad you brought up the UNESCO uh, because we're going to discuss that in a minute. But um, how do you fit a building that tall into a city that is mostly horizontal? What sensibilities were there? Yeah, I mean, right from the very start, I mean, if you're asked to do a competition, you have to decide whether or not you want to do it. Um, you know, you look at the, the context, the culture, and say, is it reasonable that this, this project should happen? Um, so, and obviously, with an, having a history within, the, within St. Petersburg for so many years, you know, I had an advantage in, in knowing it very well. Um, as an outsider, sometimes you come in and you see things so clearly about a place, so clearly that people who've lived there all their lives sometimes can't see. Um, but when I looked at it, really, I could see that there was a kind of precedent of significant special buildings occurring every century for a reason. You know, when it was founded in 1703, Peter the Great, the first thing he did was he created Peter and Paul a Cathedral, a church, a spire, a very delicate golden spire. And, and um, religion was the, the focus of that time. And then as the city had to develop, and it's a huge city, um, it, it developed from trade with the West. It was the window to the West. And the Admiralty Building became the next focus in the next century for shipping trade. And then the Communists came, and for them it was the Communications Tower, uh, which 
probably ironically, it was, the start was about communicating within uh, Russia, but then has, n has now become something that's celebrated and, and illuminated, actually, um, to, to kind of show uh, communication with, with the outside world. So now when you, when you land in the aeroplane, um, you actually see the communications tower, which is the same height as the Eiffel Tower uh, in the landscape. And, and so it's bizarre for me to, when some people suggest, well, there's no precedent for tall buildings in the city. Well, the right in saying the general grain, the horizontal, um, is, 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 say, the ordinary is horizontal. But then the special buildings come along, which are vertical dominance, as the Russians people call them, vertical dominance. And ours is the latest version of that. And, and what ours does is it celebrates the most important issue of our time, which is energy. One of the things I noticed in your presentation was uh, a diagram that looked like sight lines. So you are working and sensitive to sight lines within the city, kind of like the situation where uh, in London they're working with sight lines around St. Paul's Cathedral. What are the landmarks or what, what are the sight lines trying to preserve? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I think you, you have to respect uh, historical buildings and give them a dignity. Um, and, and you do that by sometimes giving them space. And for us, uh, we looked at the Palace Square, at the, kind of the, the, the central area of St. Petersburg, and we wanted to make sure that we weren't going to detract in any way by creating a, a, an off-axis um, landmark, which would somehow pull the view away from, um, from that part of the city. Um, as as you, you look through the city grain, you actually find it's, it's our site is, is six kilometers actually from that city center, six kilometers, um, okay, 5.6 kilometers. But it's, it's so far away that it doesn't affect the, the, the intense grain of the center of the city. You know, the buildings are very close to each other and therefore there are only one or two areas, such as on the Fontanka, um, where you actually get a vista towards the tower. And on the Fontanka, instead of three chimneys being the landmarks, it's, not, it's going to be um, a building of significance. Um, so I think we're actually contributing to the urban green and the urban pattern with what we're doing. Is this kind of a new axis that you're opening up, or is this taking advantage of something that's already there? No, I, actually, w the analysis that we're talking about here is uh, the, the, kind of l the, the uh, distant analysis, you know, from, this, from the city center out to the tower. The, the, the actual development itself will be um, the linchpin of a huge new brownfield development um, on the banks of the Okta, which is the second river within St. Petersburg. Uh, so you have the Neva, which runs through the center, then you have the Okta, which comes off. And our site is a very special site, a triangular site, where these two meet. And that, that area in which our building is located has no historical buildings in it. It's, it's all brownfield development. And so when, when you say about opening up new vistas, I believe that um, we were employed to create a master plan for that site, 74 hectares of site, and we create new vistas within that to our, to our project, to our tower. I was going to ask you about UNESCO and their involvement, uh, and I'm not going to recite the acronym of what UNESCO is, but one of the things they do is preserve World Heritage Sites, is that right? Absolutely, yeah. You know, they, they go around the world looking for, for special cities, special places um, and that need to be preserved for future generations, you might say. Okay, so in order to get their World Heritage designation, there are certain guidelines that you have to follow, is that right? Yeah, basically a city would have to um, agree with them that um, they should be listed and, and um, agree to develop a management plan for the city uh, to, so that UNESCO can agree to see that it is going to be preserved going forwards. And you, you've already told me that the relationship uh, is really between UNESCO and the city of St. Petersburg. So what kind of interaction have you had? H have they cramped your style at all on this tower? Or what, what, is their, what have their conversations uh, been like? Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing is that UNESCO don't doubt the quality of what we've designed. Uh, they don't doubt the fact that it would regenerate an area of the city. Um, what I think is the key issue for them is the precedent it would create of having a tall building uh, within a historical city. I think that's my personal view. I think that's, that's the problem that they have with it. Um, we can't do anything about that. You, you know, I think if the tower was in another location, it would be too far away from the city center to be relevant 
to the city itself. It would be in another city. Do you understand what I mean? If it was in a, an outlying town, it would have no relevance to the city. And the key thing here is the word preservation. Because if you take Venice, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tiny object which can, you can almost imagine a, a large dome being laid over the top of it to preserve it. But for this site, it's, it's a huge area. It's got 4.6 million people in it. It's not about preservation, it's about putting life into it and keeping it living so that it can look after itself. You, know, you will never be able to preserve this as a museum piece because of the, the, the huge scale of it. And in some ways it's not that precious either because it has a huge working docks, you know, which is part of the lifeblood of the city. Um, it, it, it has an industrial side to it which has grown with it. And what we're now hoping to do is to create an economical in investment into the city which will strengthen the eastern side of, of the site, of, of, of the city centre. One of the things I've, I found interesting was that your firm recently won an award for, uh, for work in the Middle East uh, for Islamic design, which I know you have an office in Dubai, but that's pretty interesting that an international firm comes in and kind of nails it mm. exactly right in the design of a building. Um, how did you accomplish that? Well, I think what I said before was that sometimes when you live in a place, you're too close to it. You can't see it. And, and, and as an international architect, you can come in, and if you take the time to research, you take the time to understand, um, and, and you do so much work before you ever lay pen to paper, you can actually see things occurring, patterns within society or culture that, that create the sense of place that's so beautiful about, uh, about place and, and what makes it special. And, and that's exactly what's happened here. It, it's actually um, our, our American studio that's been looking at, at um, these particular projects in Libya. And the Edinburgh studio, um, we're, we're looking at other areas of the Middle East in, in a very similar way. Um, so um, whilst the, 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 the Dubai studio is doing that too, the, you know, the, we're all working together and we're all exchanging ideas, um, I don't think you need to actually live there to really understand it. I know what it's like to have to go into a place and to be working on some kind of uh, some kind of project that kind of captures the character of the area uh, and just all of the things that you have to learn and the time that you have to spend there. How long does it typically take you or your people to go into a new place and get to know a culture well enough to reflect it in a design? I don't think it's about a period of time as much an intensity of exposure to what's there. Um, you know, and I've been looking at some projects in the Middle East recently, and I've basically just invested in going there and immersing myself in it, um, going to, to the museums and, and visiting the historical buildings and, and doing things which are quite tough in our commercial, you know, real world, um, to take the time to do that and to take the time to get to know real people there who can share with you their thoughts about it, visit local architects and, and get their view on life as well. Um, Look, talk to the local universities, all these things is, is, is how we, we develop our thinking. Um, what is the sign to you that people really get it, what you're trying to do, that you've kind of hit the nail on the head when you've, when you've come up with a design? What are those aha moments like or what kind of adjustments do you have to typically make? I, I actually think when they start to contribute uh, to whatever you've designed. They're not saying, will it be like this or not? They're saying, if we did this, it would be even better. Where you, you suddenly see them as part of the team and they start to invest in it. Um, and, and that's what it's all about, really, because the client, the contractor, you know, the architect, the engineer, that we're all part of a team. And it's a team game, architecture, really. And, and, but the client's an important part of that. For us, they're central. You know, we need to, to, to invest with the time with them and for, for, for them to share things that maybe normally they wouldn't share with us um, in order to, to um, understand it more. And for, for them, they don't, sometimes they don't know what they're saying. Because for, it, for us, they're kind of exposing patterns and exposing ideas um, which are really valuable and which they, they, they want something, but they just don't know how to quite express it. Which kind of gets back to uh, the title of your program, The Politics of High Rise. Uh, Russia, an, an easy place to work, a hard place to work, uh, an easier place if you know the people. What's that like? It's probably one of the toughest places in the world to work. And we work all over the world. We have studios in Shang you know, Shanghai, China, um, in, in, um, in the Middle East, in America, um, and in Europe. And 
Russia is without doubt the most difficult. It has the most difficult climate in, in terms of St. Petersburg and Moscow. Um, the rules and regulations are being adopted from the communist era, so there's very little room for maneuver within that. So, so when you look at international precedent for normal design, it's quite hard to apply these in, in Russia with the, with the, with the codes uh, that, that they have. And then, of course, you know, the, the, planning guide, the, the planning restrictions and the planning guidelines um, are, are quite onerous, very onerous. They have layers of bureaucracy to that. Um, so to navigate through that is a real challenge. Tell me about the status of the Gazprom Tower under construction. Is this going ahead? <laughs> um, it's not under construction because we only recently got permission for the height of the project. Okay. Uh, now the governor um, has, has indicated that she's changed the rules, the regulations on this specific site. And for me, that was a fantastic um, event. It's not for the whole city. It's for this site. It's just changed the, the, the restrictions. And that allows these special buildings to have space around them to breathe. I, imagine now she changed the regulations and you've got 50 towers next to, to this Gazprom project. Well, that would just be wrong. It, it has to be special. It has to stand alone. And it has to follow the precedent of previous generations and, and centuries. Um, so this is a, 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 the start of something, really. And it allows us to submit for the technical approvals and to move forward um, with the pile tests and everything that you need to do. But this project is moving forward, correct? Definitely. Despite yeah. the, uh, I don't know if the same economic rules quite apply to, uh, to an oil company uh, in Russia that apply elsewhere, but the project is moving forward in this economy, right? Absolutely. I, I met with the, the key people within Gazprom only two or three weeks ago, and it was very clear, not only was it going ahead, but we need to decide on a few things very soon. Um, details that we're, again where the clients investing in the project and talking about is that shade of glass the right shade of glass you know that who's going to waste time on a detail like that if we don't have a project going ahead well Tony Kettle thank you and uh, and good luck with this building it's it's beautiful and uh, look at we'll look at pictures on the web because you really have to see this uh, Tony Kettle is the international principal with RMJM in uh, Edinburgh one of the lecturers at the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitats 2009 conference in Chicago.